Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Okay, well, good morning or afternoon or evening or whatever it is for you. So we're ready to dive into MOSFET physics now. We've reviewed some basic terminology of transistors, on current, off current, subthreshold swing, things like that. We've reviewed some semiconductor physics, and now we're ready to dive into device physics. So what I want to do in this lecture is to give you a very simple physical picture of how a transistor operates. Okay, so here's our cartoon sketch of a MOSFET. We've got an N plus source of electrons, we have an N type drain for electrons to go out, and we have a channel in between, and we've biased the gate above threshold, so there is indeed a channel. Now, to understand this device, we should draw an energy band diagram. So let's talk about energy band diagrams for just a second. And here I want to quote uh, Herb Cromer. So Herb uh, won a Nobel Prize a few years back. He's an outstanding semiconductor physicist, and he has a habit of saying some things that are very quotable. And this is particular quote is something I like because I, I really feel that this is true. Herb says that if, in discussing a semiconductor problem, you can't draw an energy band diagram, this shows that you don't know what you're talking about. Now, Herb also has a corollary, and his corollary says that if you can draw an energy band diagram, but you don't, your audience won't know what you're talking about. So what we want to do this morning is to draw energy band diagrams for MOSFETs and use those energy band diagrams to understand how the device operates. So an energy band diagram is not an energy level diagram. Remember we talked about isolated silicon atoms where we have these individual energy levels in the atom. Um, in a solid, these energy levels become energy bands. We sketch these energy bands, just the uppermost one, the uh, top of the valence band, below that most of the states are filled. There's an energy gap. For silicon, it's about 1.1 electron volts. And then there's the bottom of the conduction band, and most of the states above the bottom of the conduction band are empty. Now, in a crystal, the electrons are delocalized. They're free to move throughout the crystal. These energy bands are not localized to individual silicon atoms. They extend throughout the crystal. So we're going to be interested in plotting the bottom of the conduction band versus position and the top of the valence band versus position. Now, in doing these plots, it's going to be very important to locate the Fermi level on the plot. And you'll remember that the Fermi function tells us the probability that a state is occupied. States that are above the Fermi level are mostly empty. States that are below the Fermi level are mostly filled. If they're way below the Fermi level, they're completely filled. If they're way above the Fermi level, they're completely empty. Now, frequently, we also approximate the uh, Fermi function by a Boltzmann distribution. If the energy states, for example, are way above the Fermi, way above the Fermi level, then I can ignore the one in the denominator here, and I simply have an exponential probability of the states being occupied. We call this a non-degenerate semiconductor, or Boltzmann statistics. So if I have a uniform semiconductor in my energy band diagram, which remember is energy versus position in the crystal now, is just two straight lines, bottom of the conduction band, top of the valence band, and the Fermi level is up near the conduction band, which denotes that I have a few electrons in the conduction band. I can relate the electron density to the location of the Fermi level. It's exponentially dependent on the separation between the bottom of the conduction band and the Fermi energy. And remember that the product of the electron density and the hole density is always this material parameter Ni squared in equilibrium. If I have a uniform p-type semiconductor, it's the same sort of thing, but the Fermi level is down by the valence band. I have a relation very similar, which tells me that the hole density is exponentially related to the separation between the Fermi energy and the top of the valence band. The lower the Fermi energy is, the higher the density of holes is. And again, NP is equal to NI squared. Okay, so now we're ready to try to draw an energy band diagram for the MOSFET. Now, this MOSFET is a two-dimensional device. Actually, it's a three-dimensional device. There's another dimension coming out of the board. That's the width of the MOSFET. So in order to get an idea about what's going on here, we're just going to draw an energy band diagram in one direction at one location. 
So we'll ask, what do the energy bands look like as we go across the top surface from the source, underneath the gate, across the channel, and out the drain? We'll plot an energy band diagram right along that surface, and that, that will give us a lot of insight into how this device operates. So if we begin at the n-type source, we have to have the Fermi level up near the conduction band. The n-type drain is the same thing. The p-type channel, the Fermi level is down near the valence band. So if I had an n-type semiconductor, a p-type semiconductor, and an n-type semiconductor in isolation, that's what the energy band diagram would look like. But we don't have them in isolation. The Fermi energy is sort of like the water level in a lake. The, the higher the level, uh, the more the states are filled. Electrons flow from high Fermi level to low Fermi level. So when I put these semiconductors together conceptually, there's going to be some rearrangement of the charge. That rearrangement of the charge will set up electric fields. The electric fields will change the electrostatic potential. Okay, so let's conceptually think about these isolated semiconductors. And one of the principles that we begin with is that in equilibrium, the Fermi level is constant, just like the fluid level in a lake that has an uneven bottom. Now, once we have some charge transfer occurring and we set up electric fields, we'll get differences in electrostatic potential. And we should remember from freshman physics that the potential energy of an electron is lowered in the presence of a positive electrostatic potential. So these are electron energy band diagrams. So the bottom of the conduction band will be lowered from its value and zero electrostatic potential by an amount Q times the electrostatic potential. Same thing with the valence band. It will also be lowered in energy. So when we get all done, we'll draw an energy band diagram like this. The n-type source is over here with the, con with the Fermi level by the conduction band. The n-type drain looks similar. The p-type channel has the Fermi level down near the valence band, but I've had to shift these bands in order to make the Fermi level line up into one constant value. That shifting just means that the electrostatic potential is different in the different regions, and that was accomplished by the charge transfer. Okay. In practice, we can smoothly connect all of this, and we can see the energy band diagram in equilibrium. N-type source, P-type channel, N-type drain. So that's our equilibrium energy band diagram for the MOSFET. Now the next thing we want to talk about is what is the effect of adding a gate voltage? Well, still in equilibrium, no current will flow because we have an insulator under the gate electrode, but what if we put a positive voltage on the gate? What's going to happen? So let's look at that again. A positive voltage on the gate is going to induce a positive potential in the semiconductor, the p-type semiconductor underneath the gate. That's going to lower the energy of the conduction and valence bands underneath the gate and push them down. So a positive potential pushes things down. So if I just look at the conduction band, the, the valence band is down here. It's really not relevant to us now. Here's my Fermi level, N plus source, N plus drain, P-type semiconductor, the valence band is here somewhere. Now, if I apply a positive gate voltage, I'm going to lower the potential and push the energy band down. If I apply a very positive gate voltage, I'll push it way down. So the conduction band in the P-type semiconductor will be pushed down close to the Fermi level. You know, we'll say we've inverted the p-type semiconductor and it's now become n-type. Now electrons can easily hop from the source and get into the channel and we have an n-type channel. We can relate the density of electrons in the channel easily by this expression. It's exponentially related to the separation between the Fermi level and the bottom of the conduction band. And we can also calculate the total charge per square centimeter, it's just the integral of that electron density in depth in the semiconductor. Remember, we're doing this at the top surface. We have to integrate with depth into the semiconductor and integrate all of that charge. Okay, so we understand what happens when we apply a gate voltage. What happens if we apply a drain voltage? Well, the same thing. If I apply a drain voltage, I'll lower the Fermi level and I'll also lower the conduction band edge in the drain. 
and I'll just pull the energies down at the drain end. Okay, so let's see how that works. Applying a voltage pulls the Fermi level down. In order to maintain charge neutrality, I have to maintain the same separation between the Fermi level and the conduction band, so that's pulled down also. And we just have to pull that energy band diagram down. So here we are. Now we've got the energy band diagram of a MOSFET. So we have an N plus source. We have an N plus drain. Notice that I'm not drawing the Fermi level continuously across the device because I'm out of equilibrium. So there is some smooth variation of the quasi-Fermi level or electric, electrochemical potential, but the Fermi level in the source and the Fermi level in the drain are different. In fact, they're different by an amount Q times the voltage that's been applied between the drain and the source. So that voltage just separates the Fermi levels in the two contacts. Okay. All right, so this is my energy band diagram for the MOSFET. And if I understand this energy band diagram, I can really now explain physically how a transistor operates. So here are the current voltage characteristics of a real MOSFET. These are measured characteristics of a MOSFET that's a few years old, N-channel silicon MOSFET. And we now have enough, if we understand energy band diagrams, we can understand why the current voltage characteristics have this shape. So let's take a look. We have this low voltage regime where the device operates like a voltage-controlled resistor. Current is proportional to voltage. One over the slope of that line is the resistance of the channel. And the higher the gate voltage, the lower that resistance is. That's the linear region of operation of a MOSFET. OK, let me, draw my, let me sketch my energy band diagram. Here's the conduction band in the source. Here's the conduction band in the drain. It's just a little bit lower than the conduction band in the source because I've applied a very small voltage. The uh, conduction band in the p-type channel is far away from the Fermi level, which is down here. But if I apply a positive gate voltage, I push the conduction band in the channel down, lower the barrier, let electrons flow into the channel, and I make an n-type channel. In fact, you'll notice that under high gate voltage, when I've pushed the barrier down and let electrons go in, the slope of the energy band diagram in the channel is linear. The slope of the energy band, you know, energy bands are changing because the electrostatic potential is changing. The slope of the energy band diagram is just the electric field. The constant slope here means I have a constant electric field under small drain to source bias. Okay, so that's how we understand the operation of the MOSFET in the small voltage linear regime in terms of an energy band diagram. Let's go up here to the high voltage regime where the device operates more like a voltage controlled current source. So if we take a look at the energy band diagram there, it looks similar. We just have a much larger voltage on the drain now, so we pull the conduction band in the drain way down. But if we have a zero gate voltage, we still have a big barrier in the channel. So the device is off. There's a little bit of current flowing. That's the off current we talked about in lecture one. But now if I apply a larger and larger gate voltage, I push that energy down, I allow electrons to flow out and just drop down the potential energy barrier and come out the drain. So that's how we modulate the current under high gate voltage regimes. If you look at the slope here, you can see we have a small electric field near the source we have a very high electric field near the drain. Most of the potential is dropping there. So we can understand these current voltage characteristics just in terms of manipulating energy barriers that control current flow. That's what a transistor is all about. It's a barrier controlled device and we modulate the current voltage characteristics or the current flow just by modulating the height of that barrier. Okay, so we're going to be using this physical picture throughout the course because it gives us a very simple way to understand this device. So we're going to be focusing on this barrier because that's what's controlling the current flow. In particular, we'll be focusing on the top of the barrier. And we will learn in uh, next week's lectures when we talk about MOS electrostatics that in a well-designed transistor, we can control the charge at the top of that barrier to be a very precisely determined quantity. 
we've seen that current is just charge times velocity. So if we can evaluate the velocity at the top of that barrier, we know the drain current. And the current is continuous everywhere. So the current doesn't magically appear or disappear because there's no recombination or generation. So we'll be calling, we'll be focusing on this regime that's called the top of the barrier. It's also known as the virtual source. That's a term that I'll be using interchangeably throughout the course. There's a region of the energy band diagram underneath the gate where the energy is strongly controlled by the gate potential. The gate just pushes the energy barrier up and down. And then there's a region of the energy band diagram where the potential is strongly controlled by the, by the drain voltage and the electric fields can get very high. So we have this region under the strong control of the gate and a region under the strong control of the drain. And and if we've designed the transistor correctly, then the height of this barrier is almost completely controlled by the gate voltage and is very little controlled by the drain voltage. Then we have a well-designed transistor and we'll talk a lot about what an electrostatically well-designed transistor means. Okay, now we should, you know, that's basically the physical picture that I want to mention. I just want to remind you that this is really a, a two-dimensional device and actually a three-dimensional device with a third dimension coming out. We've only looked at the energy band diagram across from, excuse me, across from the source, across the channel to the drain. We haven't looked at the energy band diagram throughout this whole structure. That can be computed. It has to be done numerically with a computer program and it looks something like this. So here's a MOSFET, here's our source, here's our gate, here's our drain, and this is the depth of the devices going into the page here. Here are the energy band diagrams under equilibrium. The one that we sketched was just this one, conduction band in the source, a barrier in the channel, conduction band in the P-type uh, channel, and then the conduction band goes down again in the source. Now when we apply a large gate voltage, we increase the potential in the semiconductor and that pulls the conduction band near the surface down and it pulls the conduction band down a little bit into the depth of the semiconductor too. If we apply a large drain voltage, then we pull the conduction and valence bands in the drain way down and we'll get an energy band diagram that looks like this. So the one that I have been sketching here was just this line along the surface Here's the computed quasi-Fermi level. You can see that we have a different Fermi level in the source than we have in the drain. And if we compute this numerically, we can resolve the electrochemical potential throughout the channel. So that's what the 2D uh, energy band diagram looks like. Okay, so I've given you a very simple physical picture of how a MOSFET operates in terms of energy band diagrams. And this is really the essential physics. This is what a transistor is all about, manipulating those energy barriers. A MOSFET is a barrier control device. Many different types of transistors, not everyone, but many different types of transistors operate on this principle of, of uh, barrier control. Okay, so now that we understand the essential physics, we can dive into the math and derive the IV characteristics. And in the next lecture, we'll do that in the traditional textbook way before we dive into how you uh, refine that approach so that it more accurately describes these very small transistors that are being manufactured today. So thank you. <laughs>